Good morning, everyone, and welcome to my talk on computation on iPhone and iPad. I'm Alex Berry. I'm a graduate from UTAS, and I work for a secret lab. It's too quiet? OK. Sorry about that. Please do tell me if I speak too quietly. It's kind of a bad habit of mine. So yeah, I'm a graduate of UTAS. I work for Secret Lab. We make all kinds of iPad, iPhone games, and other things, useful things too. Uh, there's been a lot of us presenting. You're probably a bit overwhelmed with how many of us. I think there's like nine. So yeah, I probably don't need to introduce too many, uh, too much more about what we do because everyone said it already. So I'm going to be talking about computation on iPad and iPhone, which is essentially about how you can make the most of what the iPhone and iPad processors can do and when you should actually care about using efficient code on iPhone and iPad, and when you shouldn't. All right. We live in the future. We live in a world where we can hold a device in our hand which can do a million things per second, a million calculations, more. We hold the power of a 2000 age supercomputer in our hand, and that's what an iPod or iPhone or iPad is carried around, we can use it for all kinds of incredible things. And exposing those things to your user is your job as developers. So that means you have to understand the capabilities of your device. You have to know the limitations of your device, and you have to know what you can do with those limitations. And surprisingly, those limitations are pretty small, pretty high, if you like. You have an incredible amount that you can actually do, but you have to know where to start. Right iPhone and iPad work on the ARM processor scheme. So it's not the same as x86. Uh, for the most part, it doesn't actually matter what the processor is, but you do need to know how fast they go. So the 3G, when it came out and still, uses the Samsung ARM11, which runs at 412 MHz. The megahertz is slightly arbitrary, but anyway. Um, 3GS uses the Cortex. The 4 uses the Apple A4, which is a new processor, which runs significantly faster on certain tasks. And the iPad also uses the A4 at a higher processor rate. Slightly more important and than the actual exact model of processor that the iPhone and iPad use is the amount of RAM that they have. The 3G came out with 128 megabytes. This is not a lot in terms of today's computers. This essentially means you only have about 50 megabytes to actually work in for your program, given that the OS is underneath you. And this is actually a good rule for all of them, all of the devices, because if you use more than 50 megabytes, it's likely that you're impeding on other people's memory space, especially in the newer OS versions, where you actually get shared memory in that you sorry, not shared memory, you have multitasking, and that essentially means that all of the apps that you've run recently are still running in the background on your phone and are still using memory. So using a lot of memory is still a problem. And in some ways, memory is more of a problem on iOS devices than actual processor speed is, because 50 megabytes is really not a lot. It doesn't really matter if you're not doing any large computational data analysis, and a lot of apps, that's true. But it certainly is an issue when you get to wanting to do really difficult, uh, large computational tasks with lots of data. So keep in mind, around 50 megabytes is a good amount to actually be using. And you will get a warning if you use too much, and you need to take note of these warnings. Um, if you don't, then your app may be closed. So keep that in mind as well. So the 3GS uses 256 megabytes. These are some, somewhat academic, though. But the key thing here is to have some idea of what your device can actually do. Because if you don't know the total limitation that you have in your device, then you're kind of swimming blind when you actually go to create a program, when you say, how much can I actually do on the device? The iPhone 4 has 512 megabytes, and the iPad has 256. However, like I said, think 50 megabytes. It's a good number. And um, you can't actually use swapping. iOS does not support swapping to the disk directly. So if you do need to use more than this amount, then you should be reading and writing to flash memory directly, which essentially means using a swap file yourself. And usually, you won't be able to get a great deal more memory because the speed of the flash is not such that you can actually swap back and forth, which is why the device does not actually support swapping to it directly. 
okay. So there's a couple of reasons why you might want to do a lot of computation on an iPhone or iPod. First one, encoding, decoding. You might want to do your own version of um, getting an audio stream, actually working out what the values are from the compressed audio or compressed image, compressed movies, that kind of thing. And you might actually want to encode these like iMovie does. For a large, to a large extent, iOS actually does this for you and you don't have to worry about it, but occasionally you will come across scenarios where you need to deal with your own encoding and decoding. However, you need to be aware that often encoding schemes are designed for computers and so phones won't have enough power to use them. So this is kind of a lesser thing. Um, usually you need the hardware accelerated encoding, which is supported by the actual device and which you use through Apple's APIs and you won't need to write your own. But occasionally it comes up. Signal processing, so this is to do with uh, more mathematical things. Um, if you have an audio stream and you actually want to perform operations on that stream, like add a reverb, an echo, that kind of thing. Again, these are things which are supported in hardware for audio, but occasionally they do come up in other contexts. Usually when you're actually presenting something to the user as part of your application. So they are kind of less important. Image processing is another one. Image processing is much more complicated because there's a huge different variety of ways that you can actually do it, including OpenGL. But very occasionally, you will need to do image processing using the actual CPU, which is what I'll be talking about. And simulation. This is the really big one. So, and this is what I'll be focusing on for the most part of my talk. Simulation is when you have some kind of scenario which you can think of as a computational task, and typically you want to be showing it to the user. And this is what iOS devices are really great for, interaction with the user, immediate interaction with the user, showing them some idea of a model of what's going on in some circumstance, and then getting feedback possibly from the user and changing your simulation with that. So a simulation is typically where you have model inside, and inside that model you're running a lot of computation, and then the user provides input, that's combined together with your complicated model, and the model is run on the CPU. And then each simulation step, usually you use time-based simulation. Well, that's a very common type for iOS devices. So you have a time step where each frame, you can think of frames, you draw to the screen, and you get input from the user, and you update your model. And inside that updating of the model, you want to do computation. And that is probably the main place where the kind of computational things I'll be talking about come into play. Okay, I've got a small cast of characters that we'll be talking about in the next few slides. They'll come up quite a bit. So ARM is the base processor type instruction set which is used on iOS devices. You really don't want to be messing around with the differences between x86 and ARM unless you want incredible performance. For the most part, you just need to know that it is ARM and not x86. iOS is the Operating system, obviously, Xcode is the GUI that you're actually using to build for this. Objective-C is the language. iPhone, iPad, and the simulator are three platforms which you'll actually be developing for. And they have quite different performance characteristics. I'm actually going to go through some of the performance expectations that you can have of these, and the different ways that they actually perform, and how you can, well, which choices you should make in deciding how efficient you need to be, and which libraries you need to use in order to make the most of these. Okay. So I've done some tests of when you want to use Objective-C and when you want to use C calls. Objective-C, as you probably know, is the whole uh, language, but it's, it's the language which is used on Apple devices, and this is where we have the angle bracket square bracket syntax, so a call in this case is a selector call. So for example, if we have an object A and we want to send a selector called do something to that object, one call is the first column on this graph. And this is a test of pure speed, so running a call time after time after time, a large number of times, and seeing how actually fast you can... Oh, I'm stuffing this up now. Too nervous, sorry. Um, <laughs> how fast the device will actually run when you just do calls. And it's very interesting that Objective-C is actually really slow. So if you're purely doing calls and not doing a great deal inside those calls, you can see from the first column, it's slow. It's about three times slower than pure, pure function calls, which is the second column on my graph. 
And the third column on my graph is when you do no, no calls at all and just do the inner operation. So the inner operation in this case was an addition. And you can actually see there's a huge amount of overhead from calls. So if you're doing a lot of calls in a simulation where you're not doing a great deal of actual instruction inside of them, say just a couple of additions, maybe a few multiplications, some assignments and that kind of thing, then you really want to be avoiding Objective-C calls and you want to be using functions if possible. The reason why these Objective-C calls are so slow is because, firstly, they have to look up the function, the selector. When you call an Objective-C selector, the runtime has to go away and ask the object if it can actually do that selector and find the memory location of the internal function that is called inside Objective-C. And this actually takes quite a bit of time. It's not significant if you're not calling this millions of times per second, but it is significant if you are. And this is why functions are faster. Functions are quite slow compared to just not calling at all because you have to include the stack. So when you call a function, you're sending variables, you're making copies of the variables that you're sending to that function, and you're putting those on the stack, and you're also putting the state of the function on the stack. So any internal variables inside the function, they go on the stack. Setting those up and destroying them takes quite a bit of time, and so it's slow. But a lot less slow than Objective-C. NSArray and Objective-C objects. So NSArray, if you don't know, is Coco's version of C arrays that manages everything for you. So it allows you to add things, remove things, um, iterate through things, it does everything. It works on Objective-C objects only. So you can't actually put pure C objects inside an Objective-C array. There is a pointer array version which does that, but yeah. So it's essentially an object-oriented version of an array. And it's very important to realize that you should only use these when you're dealing with a small number of objects which are iterated over rarely. This is mostly the case. For most of your data, you're not actually dealing with thousands of, um, thousands of objects iterated over thousands of times per frame. However, it is really, really slow. And on this slide, we have four different types of operations. The first one is NSArray and Objective-C objects. The second one is Objective-C objects without NSArray, so just using a C array. And the other two are C array, pure C arrays. And there's about a 10 times factor speed difference here when you're creating an array. And the reason for this is that object creation in Objective-C is slow. You have to go away. You have to create, you have to unlock the object. And this has to happen every time because you cannot have static objects on the stack in Objective-C. Every object is a pointer to an object which is created at runtime. You have to then call the init, which is a selector on the object. So again, we get the slowness of selectors. And then you have to call the init hierarchy as well. So for each object above the object in its um, chain of, uh, what's the word? Inheritance, of course, thank you. In its inheritance chain, it has, it has to go back and call init on those as well. So it's really, really slow. So you really want to avoid this. And you'll actually notice that, strangely enough, C arrays are slightly slower than objective C arrays. This is not actually a mistake. Um, so NS array does some clever things to objects that make it very slightly faster than dealing with them directly on your own. So the reason NS array is slow is not so much because NS array is dumb, it's because objective C objects are slow to create. C pointer arrays, by the way, are also slightly slower because you have to initialize every object, uh, allo allocate every object. So the speed of the third column there is purely the allocation cost of objects. And the fourth column, which is about 100 times faster than Objective-C, is just a pure array of structs. So everything is allocated at once without having to allocate memory separately in different places, and that turns out to be a great deal faster, as you probably know if you've ever done any optimization in C. The main takeaway point here is think about using C if you're using a large number of array objects and creating things. Iterating, it's a very similar story. Um, NS arrays iterate about the same speed as C arrays with Objective-C objects. It's slow because you have to call selectors on objects. This is even true when you're using properties. So properties are just disguised selectors. So if you know the dot syntax on an object, if you have an object say, a pair object, 
and you want to get the first and second element of that pair, you use the dot syntax, that's actually a selector. So that's going away and making an Objective-C call. Again, slow. You need, this, you need to allocate stack space for the call, deal with all the variables, that kind of thing. And just using straight structs is a great deal faster. Okay. So this is the big question. <laughs> and yeah, there's actually a lot of good reasons to use Objective-C. The main reason is that it gives you a lot of power to do things easily. And it gives you a lot of power to do things right. So if you think back to the C days, you had to handle all your memory allocation yourself. You had to think about when things should be allocated, deallocated, when you should keep a pointer or a reference to this. Um, you had to deal with the flow of your program in a much more complicated way. You had to have a different function name for every possible thing that you want to do on a different kind of object, because functions aren't local to objects. So Objective-C solves all these problems and has allowed Apple to build up an incredibly complicated and actually really good set of libraries inside Coco and UIKit. And you should definitely be using these. Do not think about going to C to replace these. And in fact, a lot of them do actually use C frameworks inside them. However, there are occasionally cases, like inside simulations, where you want to abandon it completely. All right. And just go back to C. Objective-C is fully C compliant. So you can, in fact, just write C wherever you like. And it is a good idea, I think. I like the kind of structure of going away, writing a separate C file, and having C inside that, and kind of treating it as a library from which you reference Objective-C. And often it's good to have an Objective-C wrapper around that as well, just to make sure that you're not uh, kind of exposing C nastiness of long function names and complicated variables and global things inside your Objective-C structures. Well, I think I've covered this already. <laughs> yep. So if you're doing data interface text processing, no. Text processing is a special case, actually. Mostly, text processing, is you'll be using NSString. NSString is fantastic. Use it every time you can. It supports Unicode really, really well and does everything that you essentially want it to do. The only time you want to think about doing C text processing is when you need incredible speed. And for iOS, that's rarely the case, because you want to display the text on the screen, and it, everything is sufficiently fast enough to display all the text that you want. Audio image processing, the libraries are there. They handle these things for you. They're mostly written in C. They deal with hardware. And iOS does most of the image audio processing on the hardware. That's how you want to do it, for the most part. If you want to do something complicated that's not on the hardware, then you may want to fall back to C. And game engines and simulation are the main cases when you actually want to use this stuff. There's one more thing that you should note about iOS devices. Floats are slow. So if you're thinking of doing a simulation in using floating point arithmetic, and you're going to be doing or speed limited by the floats, you really want to think about how you want to do that. If you just look at the slide, ints, int addition, compared to float addition and float multiplication, it's about 10 times slower. This is huge. So this is on an iPhone 4. It was actually less of a problem on the earlier ARM chips. And if you think about a desktop processor, it's only the difference between speed in addition between integers and floats is only about a factor of 2. On iOS devices, it's a factor of 10. So you really need to think carefully about when to use floats. And I'll be talking about how you can actually convert from floats to ints if you need to later on in the talk. I'm giving a demo on that. OK. One final thing. I talked about the processes that the device has used. It's also important to have some general idea of how fast they are. This does vary a lot depending on what you actually want to do. But this slide gives you a reasonable approximation of how fast iOS devices are. So iPhone 3G is pretty slow. iPhone 3GS, iPhone 4, and iPad are all much of a muchness in terms of computation. They do have significant differences in terms of graphics capabilities and other capabilities. But as far as pure computation goes, you can think of them as fairly similar. And a desktop processor is approximately 10 times faster than all of them. So if you think about what you could get away with on desktop, divide that by 10. That's about the size of the model you're thinking. Yeah, the magic number is 10. Keep this in mind. So around a million things per frame is a good thing to aim for. Or if they're complicated things, 100,000, 10,000, scale it back. Think about how many things you're going to do per update in your simulation. 
and then divide that into a million and you've probably got the answer of how many things you can actually have inside your simulation, how complicated you can make it. Yeah. And this goes back to what I was saying before. So you have to think about when you want the complicated structures that give you a lot of power to describe complicated but rare scenarios, and that's what you want from Objective-C, and then you want to think about the raw speed situation where you're doing something simple a lot of times, and that's when you want to fall back to C. This is not a simple question sometimes. There are times when you want to do both, when you want to expose methods which do really complicated things, which would be so much nicer in Objective-C, and you still want to use C because you want the speed. This comes up occasionally, but um, you really have to make a judgment call quite early on in your development process. And I'd actually recommend developing everything in Objective-C first if you can't quite decide, and then porting it over to C if you really need to, because that gives you a really good idea of what's actually slow. And it's not always obvious. All right. I'm now going to go through a demo that I have in Xcode. And this is a simulation demo, which is using basic physics. Um, I think it's probably easier stuff I show you directly. So just drop out of this and go into presenter mode. Um, can everyone still hear me when I'm talking from here instead of into the mic, by the way? That's OK? Cool. It's kind of difficult to hold the laptop up there. Run the simulator. Slow simulator. <laughs> Wait, what is it doing? Uh, okay. I guess QuickTime's taking up a lot of the CPU time here. So here we have a very simple physics demo. So this is using OpenGL just to render a couple of, well, 250, in fact, white rectangles on the screen. And then I'm using the computational power of an iOS device to calculate gravity for all of those particles as related to every other particle. And then using gravity to update a position and velocity and acceleration for each particle. So this is an order of n squared algorithm. So that essentially means that we need to think of a square root of the number of things that we can do when we think about how many particles we can have. And the reason I'm using an order of n squared algorithm is because it looks pretty and it doesn't overload OpenGL. OpenGL rendering this many uh, rectangles for a non-order of n squared op operation would become the bottleneck in the system and so it wouldn't really be very useful for showing how slow this can get depending on the device. So this is running on the simulator, and you'll see it's almost instant. And the reason for this is that the simulator uses the internal CPU of the, of the um, hardware that you're running it on. So the simulator does not slow down computation at all. So you need to be very careful when you're actually de developing simulations on the simulator, because they will be running at least 10 times as fast as they will actually run on the device. So let's keep that running. So let's have a look at how fast this one actually runs on the device. So this is running with 300 atoms. This is written in Coco, by the way. So my Coco simulation code is here. I might just put this in presentation mode. Just excuse me for a second. I believe it's up here. Uh, no. Let's zoom in much easier. So I'm using a common interface for three different simulation types here. I've got a cocoa simulation, a float simulation, and an int simulation to show the difference in speed between the three and the coding style. But I am actually using a cocoa, cocoa wrapper for all of them. And that's this universe protocol here. So this is the cocoa simulation. I'm going to go through briefly what it actually does. So the code up the top is purely to provide output to OpenGL which is essentially converting it to a float array. And the reason for that is that it's the quickest way to give it to OpenGL, which provides the least overhead. All right. The interesting code, however, is here. So in this simulation, we have a set of 250 atoms. 
These atoms I'm representing with an Objective-C object called an atom. And this Objective-C object is defined here. So in a similar, familiar fashion, we're actually using properties to define all of the parts of the atom. It has a position, which is the x and y. It has a velocity, which is the vx, vy. And it has acceleration, which is ax and ay. It also has mass. This is used in our gravity calculation. So float parameters inside an Objective-C object. Thinking slow already. And also a couple of things which are actually used for updating. So inside the atom is also code for updating it. This is how you do things in Objective-C. So you have a function which is related to the object and purely this object. It makes sense to actually put it inside the object. So it's defined as a selector. So this update with time interval selector here this is called every frame. And this performs the local physics calculations on this one atom. So it describes how fast it's going. It updates the x position and the y position based on the velocity in x and velocity in y, and updates the velocity in y and the velocity in x with the acceleration. And that happens every frame. So we're actually calling this selector every frame for every object. And yeah, very simple code, again. This is not actually dealing with properties here. So these are just float calculations directly. The only overhead here is purely with the selector call. And you do use the time as well. So this uses one float multiply and one float add for each operation. So each frame, what we're doing is we're setting the acceleration of all of the atoms to zero. This allows us to go back and calculate gravity-based accelerations for all of them, every frame. We're then calculating, using gravity, the uh, amount of gravity that we should add to each atom. And this becomes an acceleration vector for each atom. And then we're performing velocity and position updates based on that gravity down here, using that selector that I just mentioned inside the atom. So it's actually very, very simple. However, it is order of n squared, as I mentioned, because we have to iterate through every element in the array twice. This is because when we calculate gravity between two particles, we need two particles to do it. So the gravitational attraction between two particles is proportional to their distance. And in order to calculate that, we need the distance for each particle or each set of particles. So here we're actually iterating using fast iteration, which is supported by NS arrays, and is, as we mentioned previously, just about as fast as iterating through an C array of Objective-C properties, of, obje of Objective-C objects, sorry. So we're using two fast iteration loops, comparing them to check that we're not actually using the same atom, and doing some calculation in here. So there's around 20 floating point operations inside this loop. This is the inner loop of my simulation. So essentially, if we want to do optimization, it should be on this inner loop. And the things which are going to slow this inner loop down are the float operations and having to actually iterate through the objects. In particular, this iteration, the top iteration, doesn't actually matter because it's only happening once per larger number of iterations in the inner loop. OK, so this is really, really simple because all we're doing is iterating through two arrays and performing some calculations, the exact contents of which don't really matter. And with this, Let's have a look and see what actual. Uh, I'll just change over to the device. Um, let's have a look and see what performance we actually get on the device. I was actually hoping to show you the um, speed on the device screen, but it turns out to be kind of hard to show that. The uh, yeah, using the camera, there's a lot of reflection off the iPad screen. There's downsides to shininess. So I'll just have to show you using the actual frame rate calculation. So we get about 10 frames per second using this simulation using pure Cocoa. That's pretty good. And I'll actually have a look at my constants. I'm using 300 objects here. So 300 squared operations times you know, 20 float operations per second, that's actually quite a lot. So it's quite impressive what the iPad can do. Go away, Cal. I don't need you. However, 10 frames per second is not real time. The user will see that it's actually slow. And they can tell that it, if they're interacting with it, they can tell that things don't move instantly. They can tell it's not a smooth transition, not a smooth animation. So the thing to aim for is 60 frames per second. 
And with 60 frames per second, you're absolutely sure that even if something goes wrong, things are going to continue to be smooth. 30 frames per second, you can just about get by with. But if you have a slow frame, then the user notices a skip. So you should aim for 60 frames per second. So in that term, in those terms, this is not good enough. So in order to make this faster, let's switch over to a simple C simulation. So I'm actually going to swap this out. In our simple C simulation, I'm actually using the same Objective C wrapper that I was using for the Coco simulation. But instead of Coco objects, I'm using a struct for my atoms. So that struct is defined here. It has exactly the same variables inside it. However, they're not accessed using properties. So they're going to be a lot faster. And it's not initialized using Objective C. It's all initialized as one memory block. So it's also a lot faster to initialize. Although you have to handle a lot of the messy initialization yourself. OK, so here's my variables and just the Objective-C wrapper code. And now the C code. So here is the code that we actually saw inside our Atom Objective-C object, which is to up, oh, actually, no, that's the wrong one. This is the code which was inside the Atom Objective-C object. So updating every frame for each object. And it's much the same. Instead of using the um, AX, because we're inside the object and the variable is local, we actually have to use a pointer to the object that we're referencing and updating. And because we're using a pointer, we need pointer dereferencing. So we have to know a bit more C for this. So it may look slightly more complicated, but it's actually a lot simpler in terms of what it's doing behind the scenes. And here's the same update code. And this is almost exactly the same, because the syntax for using Objective-C properties and the syntax for using C struct members is the same, so the dot syntax here. So this is essentially the same code. And the only difference here is that we're dealing with a C array of objects rather than an NS array of objects. So the iteration here is the traditional C iteration. And that's the update step. So with very little actual work, we've transformed this into a C syntax simulation. demonstrate how much performance benefit we get from that. It's not always this easy. Objective-C provides a lot of advanced features which you often want to use and which you really wish you could use, but you don't get to use them in C. Or if you do use them, they may slow you down. So you do need to think about which parts of your program sometimes you can actually take out and make C. And in fact, we noticed that this is about twice as fast as the original simulation. So Essentially, just by getting rid of Objective-C, we can make it twice as fast, which is very nice to know. So if we just cared about having as little C as possible, probably all we really needed to do was to transform this part. This is the critical part of this um, program. So this is the limiting step. This inner loop is where most of the calculation is actually happening. So we could actually have one array, which was an NS array, and one which was a C array. It doesn't really make sense because they're the same array. But if, if we just had a small part of our program, which was using all of our processor power, put that part in C and put the rest in Objective-C. Finally, if we think back to one of the slides where I showed floating point precision against integer precision and the speed difference, about 10 times speed difference on the iPhone 4 between those, that actually makes us think, how could we get that speed improvement? when we're doing a float-based simulation like this. So this simulation is continuous, which really makes us think we should be using floats. And in fact, we are using floats for everything. So it's continuous because there's no actual difference. Uh, sorry, there's no step-based difference here. Because velocity, you think about that as a continuous value. Acceleration is a continuous value. Position is a continuous value, even if OpenGL renders it down to the nearest pixel. So it makes sense to think about it as a float. But what if we could actually turn that into an int? So one way that we can get the performance increase out of that huge difference between float speed and int speed that you find on the newer ARM devices is by using int calculations instead of float calculations. So essentially, you do this by defining a value that you're going to divide the integer into. So one may not be sufficiently small for a kind of 
value after a floating point. So I think drawing this out is what it, better. So if you have a float, the value of a float could be 1.07. We don't want to make that 1.0 because um, just by turning it directly into an int, because if we do that, small amounts of acceleration and small amounts of difference have no impact at all on the position or on the um, velocity. And in this case, the velocity and acceleration, small value in those will actually make a very large difference over time to the position, because the position is measured in pixels and it's aggregated every frame. There's 60 of those per second. So if you think about it, we're probably not moving very many pixels per frame at all. So what we need to do is think about splitting up our integer into smaller parts. So we need to think about our integer as being not one, but something like 0 0.001. And we can do this by thinking about our integer as being divided already. So we can say our integer has already been divided by something like 1,000. So essentially, it's a fixed point calculation where our integer, which say might be 7, is represented by xxx dot xxx, something like this. So if our integer was 7, the actual value it's representing is that. 7 is the most random number, as you might have heard from a conversation I was having just before. All right. Yeah, seven's awesome. So that's what I'm doing here. You have a point divider, a point divider, which is essentially a thousand in this case. So every integer value re represents one divided by, oh, essentially point zero zero one. It is rather complicated to keep remembering where you need to do this, because when you multiply time in, you will need to think about when you should be multiplying by the point divider and dividing by the point divider. Because if you multiply two values which have a fixed point difference together, you're actually going to square the fixed point difference. And so you need to do something to adjust for that. This actually does mean that you're doing more integer calculations than you were doing floating point calculations. But because integer calculations are so much faster, this can actually help. So essentially, this code is the same as the float code with these point div differences and our floats defined as ints. And yeah, depending on how complicated your code is, this can be a stretch because it is rather complicated to get the point dividers in the right place and also to think about how large the point divider should be and which values need lots of precision and which don't. So there's quite a bit to think about, but if you can actually do that, it can actually be quite simple to just change over the code if you are sure that it will actually work. And you can get around some of this with testing. Again, thinking back to how large the section that you're actually taking out of your simulation is, taking out of putting into C. And usually it's not that large. OK. Especially with a simple simulation like this. Uh, no, that's not the one I want. I want the end simulation. So how much speed do we actually get out of this? Uh, we're not going to notice on the simulator because it's so much faster. So go back to the device. So yeah, the simulator always runs at 59 frames per second because it's so much faster. 60 frames per second is the screen refresh rate. So if you are doing a simulation, it rarely makes sense to update it more often than that. All right. So we get 30 frames per second, which is again an improvement over 20, but not quite as much as we might have hoped. And the reason for that is that there are other things happening in the background. We still have to render OpenGL, and we still have to add those extra operations in for point division and we still have the function call overhead. So if we got rid of some of those, for example, we could get rid of the function call overhead, then we, were, we might be thinking about 35 or 40. But really, the main thing you want to know is that broad strokes are what's really important, because knowing that floats are 10 times faster in certain situations is far more helpful than knowing that by tweaking this line a tiny amount, I can get 5% speed increase. You need to know about the 10 times speed increase. You may need to know about the 5% speed increase. Yeah. But in real life, we may get about a 2 times speed increase. But that's still worth knowing about. So essentially, going from objective C to ints and knowing something about how iOS and IRM work, we can get a 3 times speed increase on this simulation, which is enough to make it almost smooth. And to actually make it smooth, we'd actually just have to reduce the atom count or think about other ways to make the thing prettier rather than faster. 
Yeah. Okay. Um, I think I'm about out of things to talk about. So, are there any questions people want to ask about simulation or about this simulation? Anything at all? Yeah. Yep. You said that the overhead of calling a uh, selector was was a lot larger. I've read some stuff that says the initial call is a lot larger, but calls after that aren't. Were those graphs that you had? Were they including the initial call? Yes, the graphs were of a repeated call of a, a selector. So I think. I'm fairly sure the way it was set up, that would not actually make any difference. This would be the fast way, because it is calling the selector 10 times in a row, the same selector. So it is still quite slow. If you really want speed, yeah, go with C. But again, for most selectors, this is not really an issue, because you want to do things which are small operations, not happening thousands and thousands of times per second. So. Mm -hmm. The timing that you have to measure, yep. it's in the millisecond unit. It's in seconds, it's yeah. It's in seconds. Yeah. So it's somewhat arbitrary because it really depends on the test. I can show you the tests if you're interested. But right. yeah. Are you interested in the tests? Or? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. It really depends on the exact amount of times that you actually iterate. So all that really matters is the general comparison, so this, the comparative size. No. Um, in this case, we were doing so many calls in order to get a reasonable amount of time yeah. diagnosis that the first call thing doesn't actually make any difference at all, yeah, but essentially. Given that you're averaging but, across, oh, I see, so it's a little bit bigger, but not a lot bigger. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> what, what if I only call it once? If you only call it once, it's yeah. big, but then it's small because you only call it once. Not sure. You have to test it. <laughs> Yeah. I, I don't think it's that huge. No. No. Yep. No. For the most part, no. The stack frame, a stack trace that you'll get will show you objective C functions and C functions. So you can analyze it the same way. However, if you do everything inside one function, if you're going for the most speed you can possibly get, then yes, it might. Yeah. It still works really well, actually. Objective C and Xcode's debugger is quite incredible. So, yeah. Yep. Yeah, we had a guest speaker at RMIT last night, the game developer, uh, mm -hmm. who was uh, pointing out a, set, a tool setting in Xcode compiled from thumb, which he said will turn off the by the time they go to the compiler to do 16 bit code, which doesn't support the basic point calculations. But he was implying turning it off would. I haven't used that, no, sorry. It does, yeah. Yeah, actually, there's a couple of other ways that you can get speed as well, which I think I mentioned but might have skipped over. OpenCL is an excellent way to get speed, and that actually uses a graphics processor instead, so it's a different way of programming. And there's also a vector processor on these chips as well. It only works on iPhone OS 4, though, so it's somewhat less useful at the moment, but coming up, it will be really useful. And you can get a lot more speed with that as well. I think the speed magnifications you can expect with that are about two times over floats, so possibly equivalent to ints. However, it's a lot harder to apply because you need to know the calculation that you're going to apply to a whole vector of things. So yeah, you need to do everything to a vector at once, if you like. It would work in this case, but maybe not in some other simulations. Yep. Doing that compile for thumb speed can be significant performance increase. Mm -hmm. Do you know where it is? Yeah, sure. If you go to your, your project, it's, it's built. And just go to the build. Yep. Type thumb in for the search and build that you can Yeah, and undo. Yeah, OK. I reckon I've noticed almost twice the increase, like the incredible speed increases. Can I go to the 
you're, you're using intercalculations to make that. So yeah, I am. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah it's for floats. Like, I don't want that. So find the console. Yeah. Not much difference there. But that's fine. I'll change it over to floats. Not a great deal of difference, but yeah, there's a whole heap of build settings you can play around with as well, obviously. So weren't you testing last time on the simulator with the floats? No. If you test this on the simulator because I'm using a small number of particles, it just meets the maximum frame rate and so yeah. When I'm showing a frame rate I'm testing on the device, so Any more questions? Awesome, thanks.